His skin is white just like a ghost Thick Irish roots and his blonde hair And he sounds like a Chicago super fan A music nerd with a collection Of CDs from here to there Yes, Andy Dare is in Chicago Interviewing and barbecuing It's the end Everybody, thank you so much for checking out the Andy Dare Show. This is episode 129. I am joined by Mike Carano. Um, he did the show about two years ago. We had a blast. Um, just didn't get around to getting him back until now. Want to thank him so much. He is a cool photographer, a musician. Um, he does his own podcast. He's done his own like video series, web series type deal. And uh, yeah. Full of an eccentric dude, but full of charm. And uh, check it out, MikeCarano.com. He's out there on the West Coast. And, yeah, pretty much if you like photography, check out MikeCarano.com. He has got his own original photos of pretty much every stand-up comedian I've ever heard of, pretty much. And, uh, you know, he's he does the Love Line, or it's just called the After Disaster Podcast now with... Uh, Anderson Cowan from the Film Vault, and uh, yeah, they do it once a week, and he's also doing his own podcast called Miscellaneous Adventures with uh, Mike Carano, and that is just him talking into his phone and uh, doing adventures, going different places, meeting different people, having weird incidents happen, and uh, yeah, it's a cool chat. I'm so glad to have him back on. I'm so glad you guys are able to hear this. And, uh, yeah, we got him in right at the end of the year. I've got one more uh, new episode that will be next week, and I am going to show you guys my top 20 albums of the year. It's a big deal for me. I'm a music freak, so I take time. You know, I really take time to make sure the list is correct in my heart. And, uh, you know, I've had it a couple years. Uh, every other couple years I have a problem where I buy a new album or something and I put it way up high in the list couple months pass, and I'm not listening to it anymore. It really holds no regard to me at all. Chief Keef would be an example of that. He was a young Chicago rapper that, you know, really had the world going for him, had his own style, and uh, pretty much fell off the map. I mean, I don't know. I'm not that huge into hip-hop anymore, but it seemed like I got mocked for putting that one high up on my list. But, yeah, so this year shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be any uh, problems with my list. I got a strong 20 albums you should listen to. And, uh, yeah, Empty Lighthouse, a uh, magazine that I've been writing for for the last nine months now, they uh, asked me to pick my album of the year. I'm not going to drop it here right now on this episode. Check out EmptyLighthouse.com. I'm not sure when that list is going up. But it should coincide with my next episode coming out next Saturday. And, uh, yeah, I put my uh, number one album. It's a weird one. I think it's – I sometimes I like to choose weird albums to put number one. They've never had a number one album on my charts before. I've been doing this since 1995, um, long time. But, yeah, there's a, it's a mix of stuff you've definitely heard of, popular stuff. And a mix of stuff that is kind of eccentric and weird and strange. And I, I like putting up that mix for you. So, yes, it'll be out in my next episode. I will discuss my top 20 albums with a notable guest. And, uh, yeah, Empty Lighthouse will be publishing my number one album of the year, according to me. And it's, it's an honor to be asked what my number one album is, as if I have any knowledge at all. All right, I do have some knowledge, but it's just nice getting a little bit of recognition, you know, um, writing and uh, talking about music for 20 years now. It's nice. So thank you to Empty Lighthouse. Um, I'll have some new reviews up there as well. I want to thank Nick Hausman and the Rebellion Network for a nice interview for my last episode. And uh, do check out Jesse's World podcast. That's Jesse Anderson. He's Billy Corgan's brother. He's a buddy of mine. And we had a blast at the Smashing Pumpkins show two weeks ago. And he's got a great show himself. That's uh, available at therebelliannetwork.com. And uh, thanks to Nick. I think we're actually uh, in talks to maybe doing our own show or doing something like that or having me back on the network. They're good guys. It's a cool uh, atmosphere where they record in Wrigleyville, Chicago. Thanks again, Nick. 
Uh, what else we got going on? We got the big Jay Pork season finale next week, next Tuesday. Um, episode 62, I believe. He'll be doing a, a whopper of an episode. He'll be going through the entire year. Jay's a great guy. Follow him on Twitter, Jay Porks, and uh, jayporks.com. He's a concert fanatic. Um, he's got a whole bunch of cool stories to tell. He's also, his day job is being a waiter. He's got a whole bunch of cool stuff to tell about that. He's funny. He's knowledgeable. He's a good guy. So glad to have him on Dare Network, my little podcast network, going over a year now that we've been doing it. And uh, while you're there, Dare Network also is home to Tyler Kale. Check out his show, The Tyler Kale Show. He's out there in Hollywood having a good time. Great guy as well. All the podcasts of Dare Network can be found at theandydareshow.com or at andydarer.com as well. And uh, we want to thank you all for uh, checking out all our shows. Um, follow us at Twitter, Dare Network. And, uh, yeah, I thought I would name uh, this episode Weirdness Follows Us because uh, I have that one thing in common with Mike where uh, you go out, have your day, have your adventure, and somehow something strange always goes on. And uh, maybe that's why you guys are listening, because you always know that weirdness follows us. So I thought that'd be a fitting title. Without further ado, my episode 129 with special guest Mike Carano, Weirdness Follows Us. Hey everybody, thank you so much for checking out the Andy Dare Show. This is episode 129. I'm joined by a recurring guest, uh, Mike Carano. How you doing, man? I'm groovy. What's happening, Andy? Not a whole lot. Yeah, we're just about to uh, wrap up this season, about to uh, you know take a little break for uh, Christmas and the holidays and everything, um, but I'm sure it's a, it's a balmy 76 degrees in California right now. Here. It is. Uh, let me see here. It's 68. 68 oh, and overcast. There's supposed to be big, big rain coming tonight and tomorrow. Oh, more big rain. I know you guys got rained out a couple of weeks ago, right? Mm. You know something? I despise the rain. I don't like being in it. I like it clear and sunny and warm every single day. And uh, uh, the rain brings everything to a screeching halt in Los Angeles. But what I don't like more is the inconsistency of weather, weather casters. It's, it's, there's been so many times where I woke up and heard like 90% chance of storms today. And you go outside, and I swear to God, without embellishing, not a cloud in the sky. <laughs> Crystal clear blue skies. And it's unbelievable. It's friggin' unbelievable. Is, isn't that straight out of like a Curb Your Enthusiasm, where the weather reporter guy is uh, out on the golf course? When... <laughs> <laughs> it sounds after, like it, probably. Yeah, after, probably. He, uh, after he said it's going to be raining all day, then it doesn't rain, and then he catches the weather guy out on the golf course, and it sounds like what you're going through. But, uh... Yeah, I mean, it's been a couple years since we talked. You got a new podcast, Miscellaneous Adventures from the World of Mike Carano, and uh, pretty much just your your normal thing where you just go around and uh, you pretty much uh, let your brain go and you just, uh, you know, ramble. It's a nice way of saying it, rambling, ranting, whatever, That's for an hour. And uh, just um, how That's is that? what it is. Yeah, is that on your iPhone or what? Do you have a rec uh, handheld recorder or what are you doing? Yeah, no, I use the recorder on the iPhone and – I'm starting to come around to it's not good enough quality. I've never actually listened. No, that's not true. I've listened back to it, but I don't listen to it normally. Sure. Because then I start nitpicking. You know how it is. You become self-conscious. You start nitpicking, and it sounds horrible, and you start editing. So I just make – they're all little, little, you know, two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, whatever, and then I just string them all together and trim off the dead space <laughs> in the beginning and the end. But – Okay, yeah. I don't think the quality is what I'd like it to be. I think it's fine, but – I'm thinking about maybe using some kind of external microphone. Well, yeah, I think it's fine because you're going all over the place. You're having adventures, and it's not like you're in a studio. I mean, what are you going to do, bring out, like, the Neve console everywhere you go on a hike? You can't – I mean you... – <laughs> Good reference. I wish I had a Neve console. I would just stare at it all day. <laughs> yeah, you put that thing on wheels and drag it behind you on a generator throughout, like, the desert and stuff. Yeah. No, I don't think that would work. So it's a beautiful age we're living in, 2014, where you really have it at the palm of your hand. And uh, I played be I pl I played around with a Tascam held handheld thing, and that's got really good sound too. But I mean, yeah. just for the easiness of it, just put it on the phone, then string them together like you've been doing. Oh yeah. No, I have a, I have a bunch of different Zoom recorders. I have, in fact, I have all of them, all right. the Zoom handhelds, <laughs> because I have a mental problem and I can't stop buying stuff even if I don't need it. But <laughs> nice. but the phone is inconspicuous, and 
I'm already carrying it with me, so I always have it. They and probably it looks think like I'm just one of those guys just yeah, talking on the phone, having carrying on a conversation, but really it's just to the recorder, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're you're at 120. Well, how many episodes are you at? 129 now. Yeah. Holy smokes, jeez. Yeah, and I've had a bunch of people from that whole podcasting LA world. I mean, Giovanni Giorgio, super fan Giovanni, kind of opened the door yeah. to a lot of those guys. And uh, yeah, Bald Brian. I've had all, a bunch of people from Corolla's world, but uh, I you heard, know. I heard, I heard the Bald Brian. I've heard a bunch of them actually. I heard Bald Brian. That was a long one. Nice. Yeah, I, I like it. Was it was good. I have fun with it. I, I'm usually a music guy. I like picking the brains, like what kind of records are you into and all this stuff. And usually that kind of tells a lot about a person, like a, a, somebody's personality by what their record collection looks like or how their iTunes looks like. And uh, yeah, you, you've also, you're also a musician. I just saw that you uh, posted that you just released a uh, little album of demos recorded in 94, yeah. 95. That's, that's like my golden era of music. That's when I was getting into music. So that's kind of oh, true. Yeah, a special part in my heart for 94 to 95. I was, it was funny because my dad made me get cassettes in fifth grade, even though CDs were all the rage. Everybody had a CD player. Everybody had, was collecting CDs already. So I was I was stuck with the cassettes, and I was just the mo- you know mocked in fifth grade. Like, what are you gonna do with that? Rewind that thing? Here, let me. Yeah. Oh, you want to switch sides on that thing? And like, they're just ripping on me. Here, you want to read the liner notes? You want a magnifying glass with that? And, like. But uh, I forgot. I forgot yeah. what a pain in the ass it was, and I have this nostalgic idea that I'm going to go back and just start using tape again to record music and stuff. Okay. Yeah. And you you just forget just the rewinding. You just sit there staring at it, going, "What the hell?" Yeah, like the pages on the calendar are flo- are flying away and stuff while you're rewinding. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I kind of know what Nirvana looks like. I, I, I got to go right up to the booklet and look at it. But, uh, yeah, I saw that you record a lot of those on a Tascam Porta studio, right? Yeah, yeah. But I'm putting my vocals through right now. It's all It's got dust on it and stuff like that. But um, did it well, inter- you're, recording on, you're recording on cassettes? No, I just put my vocals through it. This is, it's kind of oh. like just a, oh. uh, you know, a, a thing that I, I did an interview with Steve Albini in Chicago. Are you aware of Steve Albini? Yes. Yeah, he's a he's a big tape guy. He's a very big, uh, you know, not using computer recording. He did Nevermind. He did the Pumpkins. He did like yeah, Jay Harvey, all that stuff. And uh, yeah, when we went into a studio, I was kind of nervous, singing like this guy's gonna be like the Darth Vader of indie rock kind of. <laughs> but uh, yeah, couldn't be nicer of a guy. Just co- completely opened up his doors to us. Was eating some animal crackers, looking at his Facebook feed and stuff like that. It was a nice guy, though. And, uh, yeah, we came and re- we recorded that, not on his stuff. We recorded that on my Task and Porta studio. So now I just kind of got it as kind of like just a little bit of just going back to that era, put my vocals through it, even though this is ending it's up. It's totally on- fun. Yeah. It's totally fun. <laughs> I love it. And uh, yeah, I did a whole, the whole thing doing the demos too. How would you explain is, am I going to, is it going to sound, I'm buying it tonight. Is it going to sound like guided by voices or pavement or something? What is it? What's, what's the style of the music on the, on these demos? Um, uh, they're, they're pop rock. Nice. They're, they're just uh guitar, bass and drums. And, and then I found, well, you know, I feel uncomfortable doing self-promotion, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like I don't want to talk about it. It's just a bunch of stupid demos. But uh, no, it was um, I've had a task cam, a Porta Studio. I had a four track before that, probably in the, got in the late '80s and was obsessed with it. And I didn't write songs. I just did like musical, like you know, just made noises and stuff and did multi tracks. And it was just so much. Cool. I, I loved it. It was authentic and it was pure and it was just I, I, I dug it and had no aspirations to write songs really. And then one time in the 90s, when I had a few months off from a TV show I, I was working on, I just went, I have to do something, some, <laughs> nice. something creative. And I decided I was going to write an album. And then cut to now, it's like 20 years later, and I'm digging through the cassettes, and I found about 100 songs. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> and uh, But most of them are are ridiculous. Like, there's so much keyboard stuff on there. And I was like, I don't even remember this. <laughs> and it was a weird, emotional deja vu. And uh, it was really, really difficult to listen to it, even though nothing... Well, it took me back to the exact place and feelings that I had at the time, which aren't that much different than now, but it was just a weird feeling like, oh, my God, how much time has passed since this. Yeah, I think it's only like music to be able to do that to bring you right back to that moment. I think so, too. You know, it's weird. Like, it, Yeah, 
a lot of songs I like were out of movies, and they were specifically because I liked that movie. Sure, yeah. <laughs> How about the TV show you were working on when you uh, recorded that? Um, Dennis Miller Live on HBO. Oh, show. beautiful, nice. <laughs> Are you still uh, <laughs> you, you still talking to Dennis? Or? No, <laughs> it's been a long absolutely time. Absolutely not. <laughs> De- no, Dennis has no. De- Dennis was uh, a good boss. Gave me some great opportunities, but uh, tough probably guy to the worst work. honest person I've ever worked for. But yeah. uh, horrible, horrible person to work for, and he he's no nobody ends on good terms with Dennis. Miller. Nobody. Nobody. No. <laughs> I, I I mean that literally. I don't mean that like oh ha oh, ha. Oh. I I challenge anybody to find somebody who's truly a friend of his. It's not it's not possible. Yeah, he's a very smart and witty guy, but you just yeah. feel the ego oozing out of him. Um, it's not even ego. It's more about he's just a mean. He's just a mean. Just, uh, a mean yeah, a mean person. <laughs> and like, I'm but was, at, I, yeah, go ahead. You know, I was there for four years, and uh, and I went from that show to a show called Mister Show with Bob and David, and it was it was <laughs> night and day. And it was like walking on eggshells at one place scared to death all the time and then this other show was like a party it was just like fun and friends well that show was so important to like the marrow of all the comedy that came after it about like the last 10 15 years such yeah. a down baking show and uh odin kurt david it was david so great Ross and all those guys like what was yeah. like your first day at mr show as you said it was a huge change for you mm-hmm. but like mr. Uh, show <laughs> okay Dennis Dennis Miller, we would do real short seasons, like uh, 13 weeks or 20, 21 week seasons with a couple of breaks in between. So it was basically 30 weeks worth of work. And then I would kind of just take the rest of the year off. And we had just wrapped Dennis Miller, one of the producers of Mr. Show called and asked me if I would come over to help. And I believe me, I was low guy in the total pool. Sure. I, I, I was certainly not doing anything great. It was just come over and help. And I did. And it was just pure joy. It was exciting. I would have gone there for free in a a heartbeat. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, And it was just fun being around it. And the the first show that I watched, we would do two shows a night, once a week. And it was the same exact show twice, you know, and they would take the best of whatever got shot. And uh, I remember just standing in that room watching it going, oh, my God, this is the greatest show ever. (laughs) Nice. It was so kind of like great. Saturday Night Live, but like the more punk or alternative. Version. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I imagine that's what it was like. I don't know. And plus, it was cool because I'm, you know, I was friends with Brian Posehn and uh, Tom Kenny, and who else? I had like three or four friends that I had known for probably ten or fifteen years before that that were on that show that I had no idea were on that show till I walked in there. <laughs> and it was just, a, it was just a, it was just one of those lucky. I feel super fortunate and lucky to even have have been there. That's really cool. Like, you know, did you know those guys from like the improv circles, or how did you? Yeah, them? yeah, yes. Tom Kenny and Posehn and a couple of other people were stand ups, and I knew them through the improv. And then I met. You know, I'm friends with John Ennis now. Cool. And uh, I know Odenkirk and I know Cross, but I, I don't know them well. Got you. Did you do improv yourself, or was it more photography? No, no, no. I was. Uh, I didn't do anything. I. I mean, I didn't do anything creative. <laughs> and it was we I think the first day we helped move set pieces around and then I and then I would stand by the gate and let people in who I it doesn't sound this arrogant by the way, it's what I mean <laughs> it wasn't this douchey. But I was asked, could you go by to the front gate and let in who should be in and uh not turn people away who should be in here. For example, Bernie Brillstein, the president of uh Brillstein and Company, okay. uh, got turned away. <laughs> And he was everybody's manager, including John Belushi's. And, you know, I mean, he, he's everybody should know who Bernie Brillstein is. He's dead now, unfortunately. But, uh, oh, my God, I almost did something totally he's PC. That was uncomfortable. That's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. He's dead now, and I was going to say rest in peace. And I did. I love I love Bernie Brillstein, but I would never say rest in peace or unfortunately, just he's dead now. Beautiful. <laughs> but he, uh, he, you know, the guy at the door didn't know who anybody was, and I, I know the managers and the agents and stuff, so I would just stand at the door and just let them in. And then, you know, and then I also met some other people that were really cool. Like, I met some kid named Justin who would drive, like, eight hours just to hang out because he wanted to get in even though he didn't have tickets, and I, I would sneak him in if I could. And now he's a writer, and he created some TV shows and worked on the Sarah Silverman program. And oh, nice. It's it's cool. You know, it was it was... It was fun and stuff like that. And then we'd kind of just hang out and then we'd all go to someone's house and drink all night. And it was great. Very cool. Yeah, like a huge percent of making it is just showing up 
and being around the place and yeah. like you just yeah. through osmosis you will find a, a route you will find a way to make it and uh it's yeah it's a beautiful way of looking at it um like how about that is so so true <laughs> it's so ridiculously true and it makes me regret like how lazy i am sometimes and how much time i wasted the places i didn't like well, Years. so it makes me regret that I'm in Chicago. I mean, it it is a big, you know, huge city and all and whatnot. But it, you don't have the scenes as you do in Los Angeles. You don't have everything happening around you where you literally, you know, drive. Well, I don't know about traffic, but you drive for a couple minutes and you're, you know, you're at the lot of Universal or something like that. You, yeah. You somehow, somehow slip through the cracks, and it's tougher to slip through the cracks here in Chicago. Yeah, that's true. Everywhere you turn, there's stuff. But but I but getting your foot in the door is a whole other story. And I don't know, but I, I what, what you said though is so important. I think, and because everything is osmosis. I look at all my jobs. First of all, I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no idea now what I'm doing with my life. I certainly didn't know what I was doing with it when I was younger. And things just fell into place. It was fucking just pure luck. But. I think about, you know, I, I sold a car to a guy that worked at the improv and then I went back a week later and asked him for a job and I started as a doorman and things just happen and one thing leads to another and then a year passes, two years pass, as long as you do, you do a good job and like, you know, do work hard and next thing you know, you're doing something else and then something, another opportunity comes along. That's how everything has happened. Yeah, just one because I would have never got the Dennis Miller job if it wasn't for Dennis meeting me at the improv and then just one day asked point blank just going what are you going to do and i went i don't know and he goes you don't want to stay here the rest of your life and i went nope and he goes well, you want to move to la and i was like yeah and that was it <laughs> you know and then mr show came from that because the same producer worked on dennis miller that was producing mr show and you know one funky weird thing after another and then it may it makes you realize to be more of a leader than i am and take charge and steer yourself into places you want to be and so, what, so those opportunities can flourish instead of just lingering at a job because it's easy and you're making money for years and years and years. Sure. Now I'm so, depressed. Yeah. So it's like uh, a mix of a happy coincidence with that. You have to also put in the hard work. You have to keep showing yeah. up. You have to, you know, do everything they tell you and then keep your eyes open for the next, the next yeah. adventure. Right. The showbiz thing, the showbiz thing is easy. Just don't just keep your fucking mouth shut and do and work harder than everybody else. <laughs> and and be I mean it is it's it be is. yourself yeah. every set I've ever worked on every every TV show every movie I've ever been on everybody just keeps their head down and works their ass off and doesn't complain and shows up and then you go to regular jobs and you watch people and I wasn't feeling good and you're like shut the fuck up <laughs> you know there's people working 14 hours moving lights around the entire time a lot of downtime I get it and it's a fun atmosphere but they don't complain once because they know those jobs are valuable and they know they're lucky to have them. And then there's always a guy or two on the set that's a big fucking know-it-all. You know, I've done this, I've done that. And you're like, okay, now you're out. I want to be around you. And I've had friends. I've had friends that are showrunners. Literally the highest guy on the ladder uh, at a TV show and telling me I will hire writers that I want to get, that I want to be in a room with for 10 hours a day than, than a genius writer that I think is the best ever, who seems annoying. You know, I, I, and I get it. I, why would you want to waste your time with some asshole? when you can have people that you get along with and enjoy their time, even if they're not as talented as the other guy. And that's, that is the, the key and that's it. And sure. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. Like how about like your longest day on set, the most grueling job on set that you can think of at this moment? Like, I know you're into photography. You're never a cameraman, right? Those, those cameras no, those no. guys hold for hours and hours. Those packs, um, that's huge. Right? It's, it, it really is unbelievable, and the last couple of shoots I, I was on were, were really low-budget, like independent short films that a friend, a friend is doing. Oh, you know him, Anderson? Sure, yeah. That Anderson was doing, and our friend Mickey, who works on very big-budget movies, he works on all the Christopher Nolan movies and a bunch of stuff, but he has a different job on those films, was the director of photography in Anderson's film, and just holding the rig with the camera, the steady cam rig, <laughs> it, I, it, it's, uh, I don't know, 35, 40 pounds, and you have to suspend it out from your body, and it's not held on by a shoulder harness. This was a new a new electronic gyroscope thing he had, and it was you, you get 15, 20 seconds, and then you have to rest, and then you have to do it again, and then all of a sudden you've done it 200 times, 300 <laughs> times, and I, I couldn't have done it. 
No, I mean, you have to be an ex linebacker tedious. or something. Yeah, I don't know how yeah. they do it. <laughs> it's tedious, and I've been on sets, and believe me, my job's fucking easy. And I've been on sets where it's we're at the twelve hour point, and I'm delirious, <laughs> and you're starting to get anxiety because you're like, oh shit, we, we're going to be here for three more hours. I'm, you know, I got here at six in the morning, and I, I, you know what I mean, and, and you're like, this is, I'm, I'm, my body might fail, <laughs> but. When it's over, the sense of satisfaction and being part of it is is, is so much better than doing doing a, a, a brainless job that you hate. Yeah, I got buddies out you know here working on the Chicago Fire show and stuff like that, and they're doing yeah. the same thing where it's like a 22 hour day, but then you're off the next day and stuff. So, but yeah. that that you know that full day of work it just drains you. And he says, yeah, he just needs to, you know keep his head down and hopefully the next thing will come around and uh, say what you will yep. about Chicago fire, but it's, it's, it's a beautiful looking show at least. And yeah, uh, good. yeah. So like, I can totally understand you just keep your head down and look for the next opportunity. What, what are these, uh, what, what kind of stuff were you working around with Anderson? I wasn't really working on anything. I just stopped by to visit. Oh, I got you. But he oh, that's not true. a short that's film. Not true. No, absolutely. <laughs> I was just thinking about the last one that I had nothing to do with, and I just stopped by for like two hours and disrupted everybody and then left. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, I'm not an actor, but I was in one of them. Okay. And I took Phil. I took Phil on another one, and uh, and hung out on the third one. How about this? Here's a question that's photography related. You ever take a bunch of uh, photos that were beautiful? They uh totally captured the moment correctly and then you realized uh that you totally lost all the photos you just took and uh you don't have them anymore did, did that ever happen oh, no. you know what i i've lost a ton of stuff courtesy of digital now but okay. but I, it was never it was never that devastating where it was gone it was never and <laughs> Not yet. You know what? It's got to happen. And, and but you know, I, I don't really put that. I think I'm better now because I don't put that much weight on them. Sure. Yeah, however, if it was a, if it was a job I, I was hired for, okay, I'm a fucking freak, creep, freaky magnet. Some fucking dude just, I, I just pulled into a Denny's parking lot. Some fucking guy pulled up next to me and he's trying to signal me to come talk to him. Yeah, this is a recurring uh, the theme of the, the Toronto life where he's, yeah, you're parked in a parking lot and then a dude will pull up right next to you and give you a creepy glare, right? <laughs> it's happened. It's happened so many times. I, you know what? I hate. Part of it is, is me being depressed, but yeah. it's also putting myself in, in unsafe situations. But last night about 1.30, I went to 7-Eleven and there was a, tra- a, 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 a tranny in the parking lot <laughs> okay. without without it being part of my imagination, glaring at me, staring me down in a very threatening way. And I walked inside, and then there was a tranny standing at the donut like kiosk, eating directly out of it, trying to <laughs> instigate the owner. No, without a doubt, trying to instigate the guy at 7-Eleven into a fight because he's, he or she was just taking donuts and putting them in his mouth. And then the guy at the counter was, was clogging up the line by just reading his phone. Okay. And it, it was like, and I started like fuming. And what do you, what am I going to do? I, I don't, I don't want to get into a fight, but I, I thought I, I should just pepper <laughs> all these people. Is it going to turn into a transgender Ferguson or something? Yeah. Had, <laughs> you know what? It had, here's why I even pointed out that they were tranny. Yeah. Now the girl may not have been, she may have been a prostitute or just a weirdo hanging out with these other two people. But the reason I pointed out is because they were essentially bullying the Seven Eleven owner at like one thirty in the morning. Like the guy was standing there at the credit card swiper, reading his phone while the guy's waiting for him to finish his punching his 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 uh his code, his pin code, and he was doing it intentionally to to raise the ire to make everybody in line and the guy behind the counter angry. I don't know. You know why it was, it. <laughs> and that that was bullying. And I was like, this is so fucking ridiculous. The people who probably got bullied the most are bullying. And I was in, it was infuriating. It was infuriating. This episode of the Andy Dare Show is brought to you in part by Uncle Bub's award-winning barbecue in Westmont, Illinois. Family owned and operated since 1997, Uncle Bub's is the real deal barbecue. A family-friendly restaurant open seven days a week. Also, it's a full-service catering company doing weddings, pig roasts, luau's, grill packages, you name it. They have a friendly, helpful staff that will make sure that your party goes off without a hitch. Call them at 
1-800-273-9000. Visit them at 132 South Cass Avenue in Westmont, Illinois, and UncleBubs.com. Hey, man, I know you like grilling. I know you like getting those dark grill marks on your burgers, fish, chicken. And I know you don't want to just dry your meat out like you're cooking with a hairdryer. Why not get the man grate and click through the AndyDareShow.com's banner so we can keep the lights on here at Honeycomb Hideout Studios in gorgeous Westmont, Illinois. The man grate. This episode of the Andy Dare Show is brought to you in part by Record Utopia, a music lover's dream with thousands of vinyl records, musical instruments, and sound gear. They buy, sell, and trade. Give them a call at 630-963-1957. Visit them in Westmont, Illinois at 309 West Ogden Avenue on the web at recordutopia.com. It's always a good, relaxed atmosphere. Check them out, Record Utopia. And the, the, the poor guy behind the glass, he's just trying to get through his work day without any incident. Hey, Andy, this is in Chicago. There's no glass. Oh, there's no glass. Nice. <laughs> no, there's no glass here. He's trying to make some money right. and send it back to India. He just He's just trying yeah. to put in his work, right? Yeah, but the poor, yeah, yeah, people just love taking stuff and just making it a hard time for, you know, yeah, the 7-Eleven jockeys and stuff like that. But, I yeah, I try not to – I just try to go in and out on these, some of these places. I'm not trying to hang out at no 7-Eleven. Oh, no, no. I, oh, no, me too, me too. But it's just I, – I, I just honestly – and, like, what the hell is wrong with people? And I know I have my weirdo course and stuff, but – Twice in the last month, I've stopped in a, in a park, in a parking lot to skateboard, and uh, had the same dude pull up right next to me in an empty Wells Fargo parking lot, 100% empty, midnight, one in the morning, and just back his car into the parking space immediately next to mine with his windows down and just sit there. And I don't know what the fuck that is. Like that's a threat in a, in a sort. Like why would you do that? It's it's so weird. It is. And, uh, yeah, I heard you saying that you you want to just go up and say, hey, dude, sorry, but I'm not gay. Uh, just keep moving yeah, along. Yeah. yeah, just hanging out. Sorry. But you got the pepper spray, right? The, the pepper gel is what you said, right? Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, podcast. 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 <laughs> I've been okay. spying on you, Mike. Yeah. Hey, how, how um, do you ever have issues with keeping up your enthusiasm for your podcast? Um, surprisingly, no. Mine are usually coffee and THC fueled, but yeah, I, I, I don't usually, unless it's a boring guest where I, and I, I usually pick out all my guests myself. So yeah. it's people that I want to talk to, this is not like WLS radio where you have to talk about somebody that's promoting yeah, an yeah. event or something like that. This is just my little creative endeavor. So usually not, but how about you like talk, just talking to yourself on the phone or just recording your own voice. That is tough. That's like a situation. My buddy Tyler Kale out there, he, he has trouble doing it by himself. He likes to have a guest. Do you ever just run out of steam? Um, uh, yeah, all the time. But, but well, I wouldn't say it's running out of steam, but I definitely have a, a, a sense, a weight on my shoulders that this is not good enough all the time now. And it started like 25 episodes where I just, I was going through, like, I was just, you know, it comes and goes being being depressed. Uh, or just being down in the dumps, or just being angry or something. And I was three or four episodes in a row were just me just complaining. And, and I don't want it to be that ever. I, I re- ever. I don't want it to be I, I get to rant. I want it to be entertaining. And I want it to be like a little adventure or something. And it's just not good enough. And and, it, and then, then I get frustrated. And then I just don't have any enthusiasm for it. Because I know it's going to be me turning on the recorder mm-hmm. and complaining. And And who wants... I don't want to listen to that, and I don't expect other people to want to listen to it. I want it to be – I know who I am. I know I'm, I'm an idiot. I know I say stupid things. I know I say things I don't mean. I know I'm a hypocrite. I'm not trying to be that, but sure. I just want it to be a little – I want it to be like, hey, let's go check this out, and I want to be able to explain it to you. Sure. It's like a, a, a tour guide a little bit, right? Hey, if you can see what's happening right now, I swear to God, I'm not exaggerating. I swear to God, I'm yeah. not exaggerating. What, is he unbuttoning dude, his shirt or something? Or? He's, he's, he's in the parking space immediately next. I'm going to see like a picture. He's in the parking space immediately right next to mine, and he's standing between our cars. Oh, like, wow. Huh. Like, yep. he's fucking, like, he's, he's, he's inches from me. Well, now he's like three feet from me. Um, get the pepper gel and, ready. I don't know. Yeah. No, he's no, he's like an old man. He's wearing a Newsies hat. Oh, And nice. his car is filled <laughs> with junk. Like he's got trash. He just hey. opened his door. Nice. <laughs> but um, that's awesome. Gonna... 
<laughs> this has become, yeah, a miscellaneous adventure in its own way. I like it. <laughs> well, this is weird. Like, what, what's he doing? Like, what is he, honestly, what's he doing? Maybe he's thinking he's, the same that, thing about you. What is this guy doing in his car? What the hell is I know. I think I'm, I'm more suspicious because it's full of trash. Like, he, either he has no self-esteem or doesn't care that the inside of his car is full of garbage. Or he's trying to pull some fucking scam because it seems to me that everybody whose dashboard is filled with stuff is pulling a scam. <laughs> it could be. Maybe you said he's an older fellow. Maybe his brain yeah. is just uh, starting to take that turn into, hey, let's we'll clean it out next week, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's sad. It's sad that I value my own safety over his. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, I hope he's senile. <laughs> Nice, but yeah, like one guy that does the one, like the one man podcast radio show, the best for me is Larry Miller. That guy. Oh, Larry Miller's great. How the hell Larry does Miller's he great. do it so perfectly? He can talk for an hour and it goes by like one minute, and he's got bits. Well, Larry by Miller. Himself. Yes. Yeah, he's a great comedian and he's a great storyteller, and he's been doing it thirty over thirty years, thirty five yeah. years. Or you know, Larry Miller is a great comic, man. One I mean, of the best, and one thing that I love about him, he's full of pathos. He's not, he, even though he's got a great life, great family, and everything, he still got, yeah. still got that little twitch in his brain. And uh, yep. one one place that came out beautifully was the one episode where he guested on Seinfeld. Do you remember that? No, I no. I'm sa- I'm sorry to say that I never really I, watched I, Seinfeld. Really? <laughs> well, it's it's up on YouTube. It's he's called the he's called the crazy doorman. He's the doorman in Jerry's building, and uh, you know he'll open the door for you, but then he's got a few comments about you, and uh, it just lingers in your brain. And then he'll look at you, he'll give you a really weird look, and I was like, that's just Larry Miller playing himself. Yep. It's beautiful. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when I first met Larry Miller it was probably in the '80s, when I was a doorman at the Improv, and I remember him walking out to his car to leave. I, you know, this story means nothing, but to me, uh, it struck me as this was before. I'm dumb. Let me point that out. I'm really dumb. <laughs> it took me like 35 years in life to realize I have free will. Sure. But uh, he walked out to his car and uh, he got into like one of those giant station wagons with wood paneling. And I was like, that's <laughs> a weird car for a comedian to drive. A oh, buddy. Nice. <laughs> Well, I was like, isn't the goal to get attention and drink and get laid? And I was like, that's a weird, you know, and I just realized, oh, you know, at some point I had to go like, oh, wait a minute, it's a job, and people have a regular life and families, and they need station wagons, and Larry Miller's a station wagon guy. And I don't even know if I was even right in assuming it was, maybe it wasn't even his car, maybe it was a rental, I don't know. And maybe that's I just remember that yeah, stuck maybe- with me. It might be cooler than him pulling up in a Mercedes Benz. You know, I think that's. Are you kidding me? It's so much cooler now. In respect, I'm looking back and I'm like envious. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that that about does it. How, how's the guy in the car next to you? Is he everything okay? He's sitting in his car with his phone up to his ear, and he's got the mouthpiece pointed up to the sky, so it's it's, it's not efficient. So I'm 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 going to make an assumption that he's not really on the phone. <laughs> or he's just listening to it's like he's talking to his ex wife or something and she's rambling on and on and on and he's doing that as an as an invisible insult to her. Or he might have done that a podcast. Like sometimes my mom well sometimes my mom starts talking and I take the phone and I just set it down. Oh, I do that too. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't know. She doesn't know, but to me it's like a big fuck you. Go wash your hands and come back, she's still rambling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, yeah, I mean, I just want to thank you for taking the time out. You're always a great chat. Anytime. And, uh, I appreciate it. We should definitely do it again next year, make it a lot less. I guess it was two years since you've been on. But, uh, yeah, let's do it again next year. And uh, MikeCarano.com for all his all the various things you got going on. You got podcasts, photographs of pretty much every comedian that, you know, is worth anything in, in Hollywood. And uh, uh, you got the podcast, Miscellaneous Adventures. Um, what is that, a weekly thing? Uh, weekly, and then the after disaster is still weekly, and go chugging along. Nice. Um, after so we've been doing night. live shows with that. Sweet. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, uh, awesome stuff. You got you're, you're really your own dude. You're a very cool individual. I always enjoy chatting with you. Um, any last words, Mike? Uh, no, but thank you for having me on, and thanks for calling me cool. Cause <laughs> that's not true, but I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, right. I'm gonna live vicariously through that for a minute. <laughs> Sounds good. On behalf of Mike Carano, this is Andy signing off for the Andy Darer Show.
Be sure to follow Andy on Twitter. That's at Andy Dare. And like our show on Facebook. That's Facebook.com slash The Andy Dare Show. Videos at YouTube.com slash Andrew Martin Dare. And we're on iTunes. Just search The Andy Dare Show. Please leave a review. Thanks so much to our wonderful sponsors, Uncle Bub's award-winning barbecue, Record Utopia, The Man Great, and Amazon.com. Theme song courtesy of Rich Banks Music. Thank you so much for checking out The Andy Dare Show. TheAndyDareShow.com